Hello, and welcome to Capital Compass. We are the official podcast of the New York State Catholic Conference. I'm your host, Jillian. Today, in episode 31, I'll be talking with Bishop Colachico from the Archdiocese of New York about the Eucharistic Revival. Last year, on the Feast of Corpus Christi, the U.S. Catholic bishops celebrated by launching a National Eucharistic Revival Movement in honor of the Body of Christ. This movement is intended to restore understanding and devotion to this great mystery, Christ's real presence in the Eucharist. Joining me on the show today is Auxiliary Bishop Gerardo Colachico to discuss the Eucharistic Revival and the true meaning of the Eucharist. He has been a priest since 1982, and it was appointed by Pope Francis as an auxiliary bishop for the Archdiocese of New York in 2019. Bishop Colachico is on the revival team for the 2024 National Eucharistic Congress, serving as an advisor. He is also Episcopal co-chairman of the New York State Eucharistic Congress that is scheduled for October 20th to 22nd at Our Lady of Martyrs Shrine in Orysville, New York. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Jillian. Thanks for asking me. I'm honored. So to uh, kind of set the foundation for this episode, I want to begin by discussing the Eucharist. So many Catholics accept the body of Christ without you know, fully understanding the importance. Can you explain why the Eucharist is considered the source and summit of our faith? It's the source and summit of our faith because the Lord Jesus gave himself to us. This is his gift of love to us. This is how he remains with us, with his church, his body. He has given us himself from that very first moment at the Last Supper when he took that bread and said, this is my body, and that chalice and said, this is my blood. So profound was that gift that it stayed with the apostles. And they carried through in those early days of the beginning of the church. And when they would come together to pray and to remember, this act of love was always done in remembrance of the Lord, because that's what he asked us to do. So from the very beginning, from the very beginning of the church, Eucharist was very much part of our gathering. It was very much part of our understanding of the the real presence of Jesus in our midst, his abiding presence, his fulfillment of the promise to remain with us. So it's a beautiful gift. Why does Jesus give himself to us in the appearance of bread and wine? Well, you know, the early, again, the early church fathers, you look at the bread and the wine, they are the, the staples of life, no? Bread is is the nourishment that we need to maintain ourselves physically. And, and he uses this gift from the many grains of wheat, right? That beautiful image that was used, the, the grapes that were crushed to make this wine. Uh, we, we see the image and connection of the Lord's own life, his own sacrifice upon the cross for us. So this bread and wine is elevated as the staple not only of our physical life, but of our spiritual life as well. You know, we are currently in the midst of a three-year Eucharistic revival in the U.S. called by the U.S. bishops. What exactly is it, and why is it such a critical time for the Catholic Church in the United States? Well, it's a critical time because that Pew study that was done a a few years back now that said a, a good number of Catholics do not understand or believe in the real presence of the Lord in our midst. And this is, the the Eucharist is a defining, defining aspect of our Catholic faith, no? It's foundational for us. And to lose that sense is to lose ourselves and our our sense of our own Catholic faith. So to to have this revival now, and, and God bless Bishop Andrew Cousins, who I am sure, you know, inspired by the Holy Spirit to move us in in this direction. I remember when he first presented this notion of a Eucharistic revival, his impassioned and inspirational 
talk to the bishops to present this to us as a possible thing for us to do in the nation. I, I was so moved, so moved by his presentation. I, I immediately knew that I had to be part of this, had to work with this. So I contacted Cardinal Dolan and said, did you just see that? He said, yes, I did. Did you see it? I said, yes, and I want to be part of it. He says, it's yours. So for New York, he graciously uh, gave me this gift to help plan and carry out the work of the revival here in the Archdiocese of New York. And for us in the province of New York, all of the dioceses in the state of New York. So I'm very honored to have that, that responsibility. Now, I've personally, I've gotten a lot of questions of like, what is a Eucharistic Congress? What is a Eucharistic revival? So in general, can you kind of tell people what to expect from an event such as this? Sure, sure. The, the revival, again, over three years. So a lot of catechesis, a lot of teaching, a lot of opportunities for adoration. There has been a resurgence of the devotion of 40 hours, 40 straight hours of adoration in our parishes of Jesus in the Most Blessed Sacrament, reserved not in our tabernacles, but on our altars in the monstrance. And our faith will come and spend long hours in prayer and take turns and sign up. Even through the middle of the night, there are, are folks that are um, in adoration. Those 40 hours, the, the origin of that 40 hours, why that number? When the Lord was taken down from the cross and laid in the tomb, they kind of calculated that he was in that tomb before his resurrection for 40 hours. And that's the origin of this devotion. So spending time in adoration with the Lord. So the revival is gearing us up for the Congress, the National Eucharistic Congress that will take place in, in Indianapolis. And that will be in 2024, next year in July. But for us here in New York State, in the province of New York, we will have a Congress in October of this year. Now, what can we expect from a Congress? Not kind of a Congress in, in the sense of our government, not that kind of thing, but a gathering, a gathering of people who have a mission, a mission and a purpose to adore the Lord, to proclaim our faith, to be strengthened by each other's faith, strengthened by each other in prayer, where two or three are gathered in my name. It's, it's a gathering of Catholics for this purpose of adoring of the Lord and understanding the great and beautiful gift that he's left us. Now, I just I want to go slightly off on a tangent here. Can you explain to our listeners how, because I've personally felt it, but um, for those who m might not have participated in adoration before, how powerful even just spending an hour in the presence can be? It, it is powerful. It is powerful. The great champion of that holy hour is Archbishop Fulton Sheen, right? He always spent an hour of adoration every day before the Lord present in the Eucharist. And he wrote extensively about it. And, and to read his reflections and meditations on that really is, is a good foundation for us as we even begin to have this devotion part of our spiritual lives. To, to be able to sit with the Lord, to be with him, to, to just be silent, or even to pray, pray the scriptures, the Psalms, to read from the Gospels, some spiritual reading, praying our rosary, the, the liturgy of the hours. There are so many things that can happen. You're just not sitting for an hour. You can get to that point where you are wrapped in adoration of the Lord present before you but you can have the aids of rosary and Bible and spiritual reading with you to help to um, augment that time and to make it special. Kind of think of it, you know, now that the weather is, is getting nice and, and we're, we're venturing outside, if you're out in the sun, S-U-N, for an extended period of time, you're going to see the result of that. No, you're going to get tanned. But if you're in front of the sun, S-O-N, the same kind of effect is going to take place in your soul, in your soul. There's going to be that union. There's going to be that 
that change that takes place and manifests itself, increase of grace, growth in the virtues, and please God, growth in holiness. Your mind, heart, and soul changes with time spent in his presence. Peace of mind, peace in our families, strengthening our marriages, making them holy, strengthening the vocations of our religious consecrated brothers and sisters and our priests. How essential that time of prayer in front of the Lord is. Absolutely. Now, you know, we're talking about the event in Indianapolis mm -hmm. in 2024, which is the National Eucharistic Congress. Right. Um, right now, various states and dioceses will be holding their own Eucharistic Congresses, obviously, as we've said, including New York uh, as a province. And I believe the Archdiocese is also holding some activities and events. What makes the diocesan and regional Congresses different from the national one? Well, the diocesan and regional congresses are kind of getting us prepared for the national one, you know? And it's also an opportunity for those who are not able to attend the national one, that in these three years, in this effort to strengthen our faith in, in the Blessed Sacrament, here's an opportunity that's closer to home. Indianapolis was chosen because of its centrality to the nation, and, and please God, a, a good number of faithful will be able to attend and get to Indianapolis without any trouble. But for those who are not able to, these province and regional and diocesan congresses will help to um, encourage deeper faith and, and opportunities for the faithful to come together during this Eucharistic revival. Obviously, some people won't be able to go to the the national one, as we've said. How can we encourage people to, if they can't go to the national one, or even if they want to go, to attend their regional conferences? Well, that would be great. For the regional, we have the registration is up and running. We have almost, we have a little over 2,000 people registered already for the Orisville Congress that will take place in October. So we're, we're hoping to reach at least 10,000 folks who will be able to come. The place is absolutely beautiful and will lend itself to that number of people comfortably. And we're working hard to put that all together. There's a great team of people who are working on this Congress. But to encourage them to come, again, to be part of the movement, to be part of the effort. And then it, it's not just for that one event. You, you're then commissioned. And that's what's going to happen in Indianapolis after the National Congress is over. Everyone in attendance there will be commissioned to, to go out and be national, national Eucharistic preachers, you know, in their own way, in their homes, at work, in school wherever they are, to be a witness, to be a witness of the truth of Jesus's real presence among us. Now, you spoke about how Orisville is gorgeous. We've obviously both gone with New York hosting our Congress at the Orisville Shrine. Can you tell our listeners why it's such a significant location? Oh, sure. Well, the Jesuit missionaries came to that spot to preach the gospel. And there, in that very place, St. Isaac Jogues, St. René Goupil, St. John Leland, they were martyred for the faith, for preaching the gospel. And there's a very special place there on the grounds of the shrine called the Ravine. And that's where we believe that their bodies were buried after their martyrdom. And it was there. I was there many times, you know, growing up, and, and there were very special moments at that shrine, and, and I'm sure those moments helped me to hear the Lord's call to the priesthood and, and strengthened my, my own devotional life and spiritual life. But last week, we visited again, and, and this for me was after a number of years have passed. I haven't been to the shrine in, in quite some time, 
but I, I was so excited to go back only because of the memories I had as a young teenager. And I was not disappointed. My visit to the shrine was just very moving and, and very beautiful. It brought back tremendous memories. And, and walking down to the ravine and, and just standing there quietly in that place, it was really something. There's a sense about the place when you are there. You know that this is sacred space. This is holy ground. And what took place there? for these missionaries who came to preach the gospel, lay down their lives in imitation of the Lord. St. Isaac Jobes had great devotion to the Holy Mass. And St. Kateri, St. Kateri was born there and she, she was baptized, spent long hours in adoration of, of the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. So this Eucharistic connection so to speak, is very much present in Arisville be, because of what took place there and the place of the Eucharist in the lives of those who laid down their lives. You know, it happened in the 1600s, and now all this time has passed, and this place is still sacred to us and will be the gathering place for the faithful of New York. and and anyone else from wherever they are who would love to be able to join us in that beautiful um, weekend in October, we come back to that place because of its significance. You know, as we talked about, the regional Congresses are kind of setting the foundation for the National Congress, but also, again, for people who can't attend, it still helps us it helps encourage us to become more disciples of Christ within the Eucharist. What else do you hope people get out of our statewide Congress? Well, it's going to be a jam-packed 40 hours, that's for sure. By the way, the website is up and running, and it's, it has tremendous amount of information, and I would encourage folks to go to the website. It's NYS. EucharisticCongress.org, and then also the National Eucharistic Revival. That website is EucharisticRevival.org. Now, to go to the national one, sign up every Thursday. Every Thursday, you will receive an email when you when you sign up on that the national one with such inspirational articles and teachings and, and just beautiful, beautiful things come into your uh, computer every Thursday. They send a little message, you know, with great things there. And, and it's a great resource, too, for pastors and parishes and schools to incorporate the Eucharistic revival and its effort and its purpose in, in parish life, at home life, in school. Um, so it, it's a great resource. So I would encourage folks to go to eucharisticrevival.org. That's the national one. But on the New York state one, again, there's a lot of information about the Congress that's going to take place in October. Registration really would encourage everyone to register. We need to get a good sense of how many folks are going to attend so that we can have the proper um, the proper things available for people's safety, for food, water, all, all of those type things. We need to know how many folks are going to be there so that we can provide what would be necessary for those 40 hours, that, that time span. But in that schedule, and you'll see the, the schedule will be there, the proposed schedule, and you'll see that there will be talks, there will be um, music, there will be times of adoration, even through the night. There will be opportunities for confession. The big day for that weekend will be Saturday. Cardinal Dolan will be coming up, and he'll be the principal celebrant and homilist for Mass at 11 in the morning that Saturday, October 21st. And then in the afternoon, about 3, 3.30, we will have a Eucharistic procession through the grounds of the shrine, but throughout the time there will be 
presentations and talks and, and music, praise and worship music, devotions and adoration and, and the sacrament of confession. We are very fortunate to have a great lineup of speakers. We're very pleased to, to have them with us. And don't forget, listeners, you can sign up and register. Again, the event is free at nyseucharisticcongress.org. It will really help us to be able to get our numbers so we have enough provisions for everybody. And uh, there's also a form if you want to help and volunteer. Yes, that would be very helpful. We need all those folks. We need some volunteers. Now, the date we released this episode is a few days before the Feast of Corpus Christi. Obviously, there is the literally in direct correlation with the Eucharist. So just kind of quickly asking, why does the church celebrate this every year? Well, every year, you know, after the Easter season and Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of the Holy Trinity, and then the Feast of the Body and Blood of Jesus, Corpus Christi. They all come together, you know, when we close this very sacred time of the Easter season. Every year, the church focuses in on the great gift of our Lord, and it's worthy of its own feast, you know. Many parishes will have processions. Many parishes will have 40-hour devotions leading up to or beginning with the Feast of Corpus Christi. Again, the opportunity that that feast day presents to parish communities and families, as well as individuals, to focus our understanding, our belief, and our devotion of the Lord in the Eucharist. The feast day helps to focus us on the truth that Jesus is truly present on our altars. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to record with us. Now, to close out, I was hoping in honor of the feast day, you could end us with a prayer. Thank you. That would be great. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God, our Father, we thank you for the gift of faith. We thank you for this great gift of your Son present among us in the Blessed Sacrament. May the hearts of the faithful be on fire with this truth. May the hearts of the faithful, deepened in faith and love, proclaim with great joy the presence of our risen Lord in our midst. Send your Holy Spirit to guide and direct our efforts to preach this truth with love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jillian. God bless you. To sign up for the New York State Eucharistic Congress, you can go to nyseucharisticcongress.org. And we'll be putting the links in the show notes. And if you're interested in the National Eucharistic Congress, you can go to eucharisticcongress.org. Thanks for listening to the Capital Compass podcast. And thank you so much to Bishop Colachico for coming on the show. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you'd like to support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and a review. Don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And to catch the latest from the conference, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at NYSCatholicConf and on Facebook at NYSCatholicConference. Thanks again, and God bless.